Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. What's up, Atlanta? I am your host, Melanie Snare, with an amazing co-host tonight. And I'm Giant. And we are at the Woodruff Art Center for a really great screening of MLK The Assassination Tapes with the Smithsonian Channel. Giant, we have a really exciting night ahead of us. Yes, we do. This hour documentary kind of takes you into the world, the landscape of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and, and shows you more about who he is as a person versus the iconic figure we all know him to be. It's going to be really exciting. The producer, Tom Jennings, is even here. You're going to get a chance to sit down with him. Yes, I do. And we're going to catch up with some of the attendees after to see what they thought of the documentary. This is Ray Sherman on the scene. Several thousand Negro demonstrators are participating in this largest civil rights demonstration ever in Memphis, Tennessee. You guys know what it is, Giant, and I'm sitting here joined uh, next to me by producer Tom Jennings, uh, you know, an amazing producer behind the riveting documentary, uh, M -O the MLK Assassination Tapes. He's joining me today, sir. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, you know, the, the thing that I find so interesting about this whole project is the process. You know, what was the process like for going through, you know, all this footage and collecting, you know, a, a lot of footage that hasn't even been seen before by many people since 1968? What we wanted to do is create a story without having the traditional types of storytelling devices used in documentary films, like narration and like uh, what we call talking heads or people who are interviewed. And so in order to do that, we needed to gather as much material as possible to allow the reporters from the time to tell the story for us. So what happens is you become immersed in the project or you become immersed in the film, much more so than when you have someone talking and telling you what you're seeing. Here's, here's what we're gonna show you, here's what you're looking at, and here's what you just saw, which is usually kind of like the, uh, the paradigm that we follow. There's none of that. Mm -hmm. So all we had to do is we had to take about 40 hours of footage, 40 from hours. The 40 hours of just television footage, mm -hmm. and about another 100 hours of radio reports. And we sifted them all out, and when we got down to the stuff that we thought was best, we had a 10 hour film. But how do you do that? Like, how do you condense? Like, how do you decide to, to kind of go in there and pick the most right. important pieces and kind of condense that down to 45 minutes? <laughs> well, it's not easy. And how we did it was uh, we had to pick the most important story points. There are certain things you couldn't miss that were part of the uh, story of why Dr. King was in Memphis and um, the assassination itself. So there were moments that we looked at where we said, well, that has to go in because it's just part of the historical record and it needs to be told. The second part of that was, okay, well, we still have room for other things, but we have too much. So we looked at what do we have the best footage of? Mm. And then we would make decisions based on that. So Shelly, we're heading inside to see the MLK, the Assassination Tapes documentary. What are you thinking? What's going through your head right now? Well, it's interesting um, because recently, for some reason, even before I heard about this uh, special documentary coming out, I've been on YouTube a lot looking at some, for lack of a better word, stuff on, on YouTube about the assassination, things that have been unearthed. Um, new information has been unearthed, and um, it's interesting. I'm very, I'm looking forward to this because of that. Yeah. Um, because of just a lot of new information that's come out, and I'm very interested in seeing what this documentary has to say um, about the assassination of Dr. King. Now, all of this footage that was collected from, you know, from 1968. How has it that no one has seen this footage? How are you able to find this footage? <clears throat> Believe it or not, there's a collection at the University of Memphis that has all of this footage. There has been some of it that's been seen over the years. What happened is in 1968, there was a group of professors at the University of Memphis who um, saw what was happening with the sanitation workers strike, which was, um, uh, began in February of 1968. Uh, those professors thought that this was going to be a seminal moment in the civil rights movement. So they decided that they were going to start gathering all the information they could, newspaper clippings, radio reports, uh, especially television reports, but they were smart because mm -hmm. what they did is they didn't go and get just what was broadcast. Mm -hmm. They went to the stations and they got all their raw tape. Well, those cameras kept rolling and there was more and more and more stuff 
that was there that, that creates an entirely different world. So when you're watching it, you're watching it as if you're seeing everything for the first time. It was completely successful. It wasn't what I was expecting, because when you do go see that type of documentary, you usually get someone telling you, okay, this is about to happen, and after that, this right. is what happened, and this is how people felt when it happened. But the fact that I had to actually just pay close attention, right. there was no, like you said, there was nobody to rescue. There was nobody to come in and say, okay, this part was sad. Mm -hmm. You actually had to pay attention and feel it for yourself, and I really appreciated that. The thing that shocked me the most in the footage that we found was um, Dr. King was, um, after he was killed, he was taken to a, a very small funeral home in Memphis, Tennessee, where uh, the funeral director did this amazing job in restoring his face because the bullet had taken off the right side of his jaw and his neck as well. It was just a, a vicious wound that killed him. And um, people came to see Dr. King in this very small funeral home. He was eventually taken here to Atlanta and uh, there was a much larger funeral held here in Atlanta. But there was this smaller service that went on in Memphis that people haven't seen. And to be honest, one reason they haven't seen it is because the cameras would actually follow these, this uh, uh, you know, slow string of people that were working their way into the funeral home into a very tiny room where Dr. King was laid out in an open casket. And they would walk by and the cameras were covering it. They were right there next, directly next to his body. And I couldn't believe, it's really something that we wouldn't see today. Well, tell me about the emotional toll. I mean, you know, you know, the racial divide was so great back then. Of course, now it's, it's slim if, you know, slim to, to, uh, to none really, if you, if you really want to kind of look at it. I mean, of course it's still there, but not as prevalent as 1968. But what was the emotional toll as, you know, you being a white, a white, a white male, you know, a white guy, you know, kind of digging into all this, this footage and this heavy, heavy material? You know, like how, how did you process the whole experience? Well, that's a good question. A couple of people have asked me that before. It's like, you know, how could you really understand it? Yeah. And uh, it's a valid question. Um, I've been, uh, I was a newspaper reporter before I started making documentary films. And my job has always been as a journalist to try and be as fair as possible. And I was aware of that when we went into this. You know, I, I was extremely aware sensitive of it. That, yeah. I was sensitive to it because, you know, Dr. King is, uh, it's, he's such an iconic story mm -hmm. that I didn't want to screw it up. You know, I wanted to make sure that we got this thing as right as possible. And so we went through all the material we could find, both from the University of Memphis, from old newspapers, everything we could find to keep it as balanced and sincere as possible. That's, I think, a good word that um, you know, I kept in my mind is, if nothing else, I wanted to make this sincere. But as far as uh, being a white journalist reporting on you know, the most prominent black story in the 20th century, um, what I wanted to do was do the best job as a journalist and be as true uh, and uh, sincere to Dr. King's story as we could. So we just finished with the screening inside, the Q&A with the producer for MLK. What do you think? Fantastic film. Uh, you know, being a teacher of history and uh, political science, you know, so much of what the narrator said is distilled down just the sound bites and little I have a dream speech and all that. You really get the, I guess, a uh, feel for the man and what happened that day and uh, what happened in Memphis, more importantly. More, and I learned a lot about the uh, sanitation worker strike that I didn't know before. The way this changed me is that when the film finally came together, after all those hours were boiled down to the 45 minutes, I really felt like I was uh, sitting in Memphis, Tennessee, in 1968, changing channels. I had an understanding of the place and the people because what I was feeling and hearing and seeing were the same things that they were going through. It almost acts as a time machine. So I think it broadened my perspective and I hope that's what it does for other people. So speaking of filling up for yourself, how did it make you feel? Man, it, it just reminded me that Everything that I have, it, it, it was bought the price. You know, it was, a, it was a heavy cost that was paid. Like the fact that I can just walk up and down the street, the fact that I'm in school, the fact that I can work and take care of my family and live wherever I want to live. Like it wasn't something that was just given away. You know, people had to work together and fight for it. And it was just an intense reminder. So Mr. Jennings, tell me, how did you and the Smithsonian Channel come together? 
Two years ago, I did a similar film on the assassination of John F. Kennedy in Dallas. Again, we used local news footage, local reporters, and I always wanted to do the same thing with Martin Luther King. I approached the Smithsonian Channel, which was looking for this style of documentary storytelling, which is very unique, and presented it to them, and they said, you know, that might be something we're very much interested in. Uh, can you find out more? And fortunately, um, after months of searching, the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, which is at the Lorraine Motel where Dr. King was killed, uh, sent me to uh, a gentleman at the University of Memphis that is kind of the keeper of the keys, and he had this archive. So I was able to take the index of their archive back to the Smithsonian Channel, the things about the size of a phone book and just go through and say, they have this, they have this, they have this, they have this. And, you know, my, you know, as someone who needs footage and information to tell stories, it was like really the, the uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Absolutely. And they thought it would fit perfect um, into what the Smithsonian Channel is all about, which is telling America's stories. And there's really um, uh, no story as powerful or as important as this one. What does Martin Luther King Jr. mean to you? <laughs> a lot, a lot. Uh, courageous man. I just, I'll, I'll leave it at courageous. You know, um, courageous and. Uh, but I think really what Martin Luther King means to me personally is that he's more than just him. He means a lot. He means a lot of the greatness of the African American community. He also means a lot of the problems that we still face in the African American community. Um, he represents a lot of that. So, you know, he's a great man to me, no, no question about it. Um, and so it's kind of a wide spectrum right. of what he represents to me personally. As someone who makes documentary films for uh, television, your work is usually seen on small screens or television screens, even, you know, 70 inches, because uh, uh, big by uh, home standards, but Today, we're having this great event at the Woodruff Center in downtown Atlanta in a very large screening room, thanks to Comcast and the Smithsonian Channel. And the film's gonna be shown on something that I think is about 30 or 40 feet high. So it's a real pleasure and an honor to be able to see a film like this, uh, not in the confines of our homes, but in a theater where we can experience it uh, with a lot of other people. If you don't mind me asking you one, one, one more question, you know, what, what, what word would you use to define this documentary for anybody out there who, who, who is eager or excited or on the fence about watching it? What's one word that you would describe this, this uh, documentary? The one word I would use to describe this documentary is immersive. Uh, I don't think you can say that about many television programs, documentary or otherwise. This puts you in the driver's seat in a way that few films can and I'm not saying that to be uh, braggadocio. I'm saying it because that's what it is that's what's that's how it's built that's what it's intended to be and it's intend it's intended to immerse the viewer in the time period without distractions from narration or from people being interviewed you have to engage with the film as much as the film engages with you Giant, I really feel like this documentary surprised a lot of people tonight. It definitely surprised me. I mean, you got an opportunity to see more about the man behind the iconic image in a way that hasn't really been shown before. And if you missed it, then you should be following us on Facebook and Twitter because you can win tickets to events just like this in the great city of Atlanta. I am Melanie Snare for another episode of Get Local ATL with my fabulous co-host, Giant. It was an absolute pleasure. I hope to do it again soon. Absolutely.